Hi Founder fans, Jason here, and today we are talking about George Washington's administration. Specifically, we're moving on to the second half, aka the B-Team, a coin termed by today's guest, Dr. Lindsay Chervinsky. Dr. Chervinsky, thank you so much for coming back. Oh, my pleasure. Thanks so much for having me again. Absolutely. So we have a few members of the second half of Washington's administration to get through. Um, why don't we start with uh, William Bradford? Because sadly, he has the shortest uh, tenure, so he might be the easiest to get through. Sure. Well, let's maybe start with explaining how this turnover sort of happens. Great. So in um, December of 1793, at the end of the month, Thomas Jefferson, who was the Secretary of State, decides to reti retire and go home. Um, now, he had been threatening to retire for years, and Washington had basically convinced him to stay on through the end of the year. And so once he left, the original Attorney General, Edmund Randolph, was promoted to the Secretary of State. There isn't um, all that much evidence to suggest that Washington really considered anyone else, which is really pretty interesting. So right away, Edmund Randolph is promoted, and so the attorney general position is opened up. William Bradford has a couple of really important credentials going for him. So first, he had served in the Continental Army, so Washington knew him from the Revolution. That sort of service and patriotism went a long way in Washington's book. He was from Pennsylvania, which offered some very important geographic diversity, which Washington was very attentive to. And yet he was also a firm Federalist. So he believed strongly in the Constitution and the powers of the executive. And although his tenure was indeed quite short, it was very important and very consequential because he took over at the beginning of 1794 and was a pivotal player in the Whiskey Rebellion. We could talk a little bit more about his role if you would like, but he was a pivotal player that year up through the 1795 and actually offered advice that I think Washington really valued and, and took to heart. Yeah, well, because the Whiskey Rebels had to be prosecuted and that would be the Attorney General's duty. Yes and no. So his role actually um, became much more powerful before the prosecutions even took place. So in the summer of 1794, the Whiskey Rebellion breaks out. Well, there had been a lot of protests for several years, but it became quite violent in 1794 when the rebels burned down the house of John Neville, who was the tax collector in Western Pennsylvania. And Washington convened a cabinet meeting and tried to figure out how to respond to the situation. And Bradford actually was the one that suggested the outcome that Washington selected. He suggested that Washington call up the state militias using a, a recently passed bill that allowed the president to call up militias in the event of a domestic rebellion or international invasion when Congress was not in session as long as the Supreme Court justice approved the evidence that it was required. A little bit of a mouthful there. That's but right. so there was this there is this bill on the books that they decided to use. And Bradford was the one that suggested that Washington actually send out a peace commission before calling up the militia so that basically the American public had reassurance that Washington had tried all peaceful options. That was very important to Washington from an optics perspective. So he suggests this idea. Washington loves this idea. And then he actually selects Bradford as one of the members of this peace commission because he was from Pennsylvania. So he goes out west and he actually meets with the, the rebels and tries to come up with a peaceful solution. It fails, which is a surprise to basically no one. But in this whole time, he is sending back these private letters to Hamilton, Randolph, and Washington, letting them know what is happening. So he is a very central part of that year of Washington's experience. And then once they do send out the militia and they round up the rebels and they prosecute these cases, Washington decides pretty quickly to offer clemency and pardons to the rebels because it was less about punishment and more about the principle that the federal government had the right to assert taxation. And Bradford was very much on board with that choice. Right. It, it uh, strikes to the court of the Declaratory Act a couple decades earlier where Great Britain rescinded the Stamp Act and said, 
the declaratory act saying we're not going to do these taxes but we absolutely could (laughs) yeah well and i think the the big um the point of contention with the administration was that these bills had been passed by congress and pennsylvania had representation in congress now that representation wasn't totally fair because the way it was drawn up eastern regions had more representation to be sure than the western regions so I do think that the farmers in the West had some understandable grievances and the taxes did fall more heavily on them. Right. However, it was passed using sort of the constitutionally mandated process. So Washington's reply was, you know, take it up with your legislatures, take it up right. with your representatives. There are legal mechanisms to address this problem. And and so that was, I think, really the heart of the the problem well one of uh they did but many of their representatives i believe kind of agreed with them i know Al- albert gallatin for example was representing them and agree with them and i think he was wasn't he a, uh, i know he was kicked out of i think it was the senate or was the house at some point because he hadn't been a citizen long enough about this <laughs> time yeah so albert gallatin is such an interesting case because you're right he was very sympathetic to the rebels cause and he did represent western pennsylvania and at at various points i don't know that the the measure was actually successful um i think that there were attempts to censure him and kick him out for his support for the rebels but i'll have to check i don't know if they actually yeah. worked i just read a biography um, about him like four months ago and i can't believe i forget yeah he's a super fascinating character and you're right the representatives were sympathetic and actually after the rebellion happened once an appropriate amount of time had passed they did sort of reduce the measures recognizing that maybe they were kind of unfair Mm -hmm. um so i think it was one of those things where the constitutional measures did actually work it just took a little while um and you know they were kind of impatient about that. And Americans have a long tradition of protesting violently <laughs> against taxation measures. Yeah, especially at that point. They had yes. very recent history. <laughs> yes, yes. Yeah. Absolutely. And many of the protesters actually had fought in the revolution. So they personally had that experience in those memories. Right, exactly. And and even on top of that, one of the causes for the Constitution was the um, Shays Rebellion, which had just really just happened. And yeah, I, I understand the Whiskey Rebellion was kind of approving, we're not going to let Shay's Rebellion happen again. Yeah, and it, I think it really was a symbolic choice. It was saying that, you know, if the federal government couldn't collect those taxes, then it was never going to be able to collect taxes. And that was going to basically undermine the federal government from day one. And that was not acceptable. And, and I totally get that. And I think that most people <laughs> agree with that today. It was a very important precedent to set. But it was less about the actual whiskey tax, and it was more about the concept. What was actually really interesting about the enforcement of the Whiskey Rebellion is that by sending all of these militia and these troops out into Western Pennsylvania, there was literally no better thing for the Western Pennsylvania economy because the soldiers brought with them hard specie, their their pay, and they bought a ton of whiskey. And so they actually infused the region with tremendous economic wealth. And so it was actually a very positive outcome financially, uh, but uh, maybe not so much short term. I guess even a show war is still good for the economy. (laughs) It is. It really is. Richland, so William Bradford does the Whiskey Rebellion and then kind of does he does he do anything else of note? So in 1795, he gets very ill and it's actually his his final fatal illness. And so he is not a particularly noteworthy figure after that point. The one thing I would say is when Randolph was promoted to the Secretary of State, and I'm sure we will talk about the Jay Treaty in a moment, um, the Jay Treaty arrived in 17, in April of 1795, and Randolph as the Secretary of State received it, and he shared it with Washington, and they decided to convene an emergency session of Congress of the Senate to review this treaty. And until the Senate gathered in June, they kept the treaty secret. So they didn't tell anyone for three months which is bonkers. And we'll get into why that's bonkers in a second, but um, they did not tell Timothy Pickering. They did not tell Oliver Wolcott. They did not tell 
William Bradford. And so he was one of the people who did not know. And we know that no one knew because not only did the secretaries complain about it, but so too did James Madison. He was not pleased that he did not know the contents. Um, and so I think his his other notable moment was that he was on not privy to the secrets that Edmund Randolph was privy to. Yeah, interesting. I did not expect you to bring up Madison. We could go off on a tangent there, but we won't. <laughs> because the thing I understand William Bradford to be really most well known for is to be the first cabinet person to die in office. Yes. So that's why we started with him, because his story ends abruptly and before uh, some of the other good stuff we might be getting into. Uh, so we... The other thing that's really interesting about him, actually, if you look at his war experience, when he was, um, he served admirably and actually fought in battles and was at Valley Forge with Washington. But while he was at Valley Forge, he shared a house with his brother and his father, who were also in the army. Just think about sort of like the genetic implications of you know the father and the brother also all being in the army i just find that sort of befuddling um yeah well the Bradford and one of those was... okay. yeah one of those little tidbits that just kind of blows my mind yeah well i i also am i mistaken because he was attorney general of pennsylvania for a while and then i'm pretty mm -hmm. sure he was didn't he try the first uh or, or not try but be a part of the first supreme court case yeah. That I don't know. I feel like his name's attached to that. I, I, sounds right. It's I, it sounds right. I'll check. I'll, I'll, I'll double check. <laughs> sounds good. <laughs> no, we'll double check later. Anyway, uh, let's move on. We have a bunch of other guys to talk to. Uh, notably, Timothy Pickering, who I I have a feeling we try and be as objective as we can when we study history. Of course, but I got the impression last time we spoke that we both might um not love some of timothy pickering's actions later in life but we should note who timothy pickering was he was a hero of the revolution um just a, a quick sum up you know he was involved with leslie's retreat in salem massachusetts which was before lexington and concord and was this close to being lexington and concord it was about collecting powder this and that and then he also wrote uh an easy plan for militia i believe it was called which the Continental Army assumed as its first working manual. Granted, that didn't work very well until Baron von Steuben showed up with his blue book. That made things a lot better. Um, and then Timothy Pickering uh, spends time as um, an adjutant general, I believe, or, or, or a, a commissary general. I can't remember the exact title. But at the high levels, and a really important officer of the Revolutionary War who helped run the business of the war, so to speak. Um, and then that leads him essentially to your book. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. So I think that, um, I actually wrote, so I have a monthly newsletter called Imperfect Union and uh, it comes out on the 15th of every month. And this month I wrote about how do we handle the fact that sometimes we just don't like the people we write about. And I think it's really important to acknowledge those biases up front and to try and sort of query them in our own writing to make sure we are as much as possible being honest and straightforward about the language we're using and how we are depicting people. Pickering is one of those people that I have to constantly sort of query my language choices. And am I using words that are laden with meaning? Am I describing him as um, unnecessarily duplicitous? Sometimes that's warranted. Sometimes it's not. And then I have to choose more neutral language. But Pickering is such an interesting case because I think that if you think of someone who is like extremely Puritan in all of the ways that we sort of think of the Puritan tradition, that is Timothy Pickering. He is extreme in everything he does. And I've actually, as I've been researching book number two, which looks at John Adams' presidency, I have to say my opinion of him has not improved because the thing that I find so remarkable is, so once he joins Washington's administration, he's the first postmaster general, or that's his first position, I guess, in the administration. And then he is appointed as the secretary of war. 
And in starting in 1791, he's basically meeting with Adams and bashing and bad mouthing Washington, saying that he is illiterate, saying that he doesn't know how to write, that like all of the things that he says and writes are completely done by other people. He can barely speak English. That's obviously ludicrous. He can obviously speak English. We have his letters. We have his, the things that he wrote. Right. Um, and uh, so you just get the sense that this person is not, he's very extreme. And uh, so he is Washington's second secretary of war. He takes over for Henry Knox once he retires at the end of 1794 after the Whiskey Rebellion has ended. And he's a perfectly adequate Secretary of War. He is a very good administrator. He's very capable in that way. However, things get a little bit tricky once the Randolph affair starts to come forward. Now, we talked about this um, on my previous visit, but I think that he was an extreme partisan. He was a high Federalist. He was very loyal to Hamilton, but he also shared those perspectives independent of Hamilton. He wanted nothing to do with the Republican perspective. He thought that France was dangerous, that the United States should have a treaty with Great Britain. And so I think he was really out to try and sideline Randolph. And so things get really interesting. Once Randolph has resigned, Washington asks at least six people to be Secretary of State before he finally settles on Timothy Pickering, who is at least his seventh choice, if not more than that um I would love and to know those and, other names yeah so i mean so patrick henry was one john marshall i mean like you you name it like the who's who uh charles coatsworth pinckney i mean you name it washington asked them pinckney's are i think a good he, choice. He, pinckney's <laughs> are a good choice and i think even i think he even asked maybe james madison at one point it was a little bit ridiculous However, Pickering knew this. He knew that Washington had asked all of these people and had finally resorted to him, which cannot have improved their relationship in any way, shape, or form. And so he was a perfectly fine Secretary of State for Washington's last, you know, by the time he took office, he didn't take office until 1796. So he was a perfectly fine Secretary of State for the last year. He was a terrible Secretary of State for John Adams. Um, I don't know how much we want to get into that, but oh, we could pass over absolutely. <laughs> yeah. uh, uh, but can he... can I ask? Is he part of the? I believe it's called the Essex Junto. Um, yes. So like Massachusetts, it was originally a Massachusetts party when they were writing the Massachusetts Constitution in the late 1770s and set into the 1780, um, and then kind of blossomed into this like Federalist stronghold that. Didn't really include Alexander Hamilton, but they were like Alexander Hamilton fanboys who just. Yeah, so he he was. Um, and that's when I say when he like he both was very loyal to Hamilton, but also shared independently a lot of those same ideas and advocated them in his own in his own right. So he agreed with Hamilton on almost everything and in some cases actually went farther than Hamilton in a more extreme direction. But came about that in his own way. And so he was, um, he was a very extreme Federalist. And after Hamilton, after Washington's tenure, after Adams' tenure, he then remained a Federalist and was one of the Federalists that actually advocated for secession during the War of 1812. That's how extreme he was, because he was just so pro-British, which is very confusing, given that he was, you know, such a Revolutionary War hero. Right. Well, he's one of, uh, yeah, because We've moved very far into the future in the James Madison administration, yeah. but uh, the Hartford Convention in Hartford, Connecticut, was all these Federalists got together, and the, the, the end result was just some recommendations of, like, maybe we shouldn't have Virginians president for 30 years, <laughs> and maybe we yeah. spice it up, uh, but many people were sent there, I believe Nathan Dane and other people were sent there to make sure they didn't talk about session, because you have people like Timothy Pickering... We we're like pretty much like we're done with this this experiment has failed <laughs> yeah i mean i think that what's so fascinating about timothy pickering is you can you can have someone who is a very extreme personality like john quincy adams who i still find incredibly likable and endearing in certain ways and is is still very much committed to the union and to the project and he actually you know supported the war of 1812 and supported the louisiana 
purchase, despite the fact that he was a Federalist at the time. And then you have people like Pickering who are sort of equally extreme and, and very unlikable. And I'm not totally sure where that comes from. Um, well, I don't know if it's, you know, sort of my displeasure or what, but. Well, yeah. we did skip over the John Adams administration and that's where my displeasure comes in <laughs> um, because I'm under the impression, yeah. I believe correctly, that, um, you know, Alexander Hamilton writes a famous note that attacks John Adams. And it certainly seems like a lot of the information he had came directly from within the cabinet. Now, is that Timothy Pickering? I mean, probably, but it could perhaps it was McHenry, who we will also discuss, who I, I, I'm, again, under the impression was very much very close to the same page as Pickering. Yeah, so basically, McHenry, Wolcott, and Pickering were deeply loyal to Hamilton and were frankly sort of borderline treasonous um, during the Adams administration. I hesitate to say outright treason because who knows what that actually means. But they basically shared information with Hamilton before they shared it with Adams. They acted actively sought to undermine his foreign policy. They sort of actively sought to undermine his reelection campaign. And they, you know, they knew what he wanted and intentionally kind of did the other thing. Yeah. And so I don't think McHenry was just very loyal to Washington, was very loyal to Hamilton. He didn't need the salary. He was in office because he was kind of a, a lackey for better words. Pickering was smarter than that. He was kind of the mastermind within the cabinet of this other cabal. And so I tend to place more of the blame on him than I do with McHenry. Cause I just think McHenry wasn't, he wasn't the sharpest tool in the shed and he kind of just went along with whatever Hamilton and Pickering suggested, which maybe isn't fair, but that's kind of my sense. And that was certainly their sense too. So we'll blame it on them. Right. No, it's probably true. Uh, you know, we, we will we will talk a little bit more about McHenry. Uh, uh, it, it's funny because the way we've been discussing Pickering is in a fashion similar to how most people talk about Aaron Burr, uh, only on the Democratic Republican side, which is interesting uh, because Aaron Burr is very famous and Timothy Pickering is very much not, despite <laughs> being contemporaries. Well, killing Alexander Hamilton helps a whole lot. I mean, that's kill uh, is a strong word <laughs> it was a gentleman's uh, yes. agreement <laughs> it's true it's true yeah i think you know i think pickering um still is well known in certain circles cer certainly in massachusetts i think yeah. whereas burr had some sort of he had some ideas in his favor he was more enlightened in terms of women's education and had this great relationship with his daughter and there are some things that are sort of fascinating about him and of course the Hamilton musical does not hurt. He is by far, I think, the best character in, and has some of the best songs in the Hamilton musical, which helps a lot. I've heard the argument he's actually the protagonist of the musical. Oh, yeah. It's his totally. show. Hamilton's 100%. the bad guy. <laughs> yeah, 100%. I agree with that 100%. And I, and I think his songs are actually some, the best. I'm a big fan, but my favorite songs are Burr songs. Sure. Um, Pickering doesn't have Minor that. Lafayette, and... just putting it out there. <laughs> <laughs> um pickering doesn't have that and he also like was extreme towards native americans so like it's really hard to find positive things to say about him from that is true we, we kind of uh, skipped over that is pickering almost right away in the early you know about the same time i think it's about the same time as jay treaty he comes to upstate new york right is it 1794 my date might be off but he comes to upstate new york and works out a treaty with the iroquois uh which you know, in hindsight, was very good to America, not so good to the Iroquois, um, but yes. a gigantic tract of land that had already essentially been purchased by Americans was now available to settle. Yeah. Where so I live he now. just, so there's that. Yeah. <laughs> so he just, he doesn't have the sort of, it's hard to find the part of him that you can sort of grasp onto as redeeming in the same way that Aaron Burr sometimes offers some of those intricacies in a way that I think are more compelling. Well, you know what my favorite Pickering story is? Uh, back at the end of the Revolutionary War, there's the Newburgh conspiracy, which is famous in American Revolution circles. Mm -hmm. uh, 
short story very long uh the americans uh the officers of the war were the war was over congress was not paying them what do we do here washington tells him to have a meeting that's when he has this famous like oh i'm blind now i should i mean you know I, you'll permit me to put on my spectacles because i've lost everything in my life for this war and all the officers start crying because they've forsaken their ideals and they're like never mind we're not going to do this except <laughs> timothy pickering is the only man in the room who looks around and says wait so old george can't read anymore and we're just going to give up we're just going to let congress keep not paying us so yeah that sounds right that's timothy pickering <laughs> yep that sounds right and for anyone interested in learning more about that there's a book out by david head called the newberg crisis that digs into that a little bit more yeah. but um yeah that sounds that sounds about right i mean the newberg crisis is pretty yeah Definitely go look if you don't know about it. Definitely go look more. Yeah. Not you, but the viewers. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, that and I feel like that speaks a lot to at least he has at least he sticks to his ideals. He does, even when he shouldn't. <laughs> right. Exactly. Cool. So we did bring up the name, unless there's anything more we want to go into on Pickering. Nope. We've done enough. We could spend hours. Um <laughs> yeah. Uh McHenry. We did talk about James McHenry a little bit. So he was important during the war. He was a surgeon and he served as a medical surgeon uh, or a, a regimental surgeon throughout the war, saving lives, presumably. Um, and then uh, I'm a little lost on what he does in the 1780s between the war <laughs> and the. Oh, no, I'm not. He signs the United States Constitution. Yeah. So McHenry is really fascinating because he actually starts out his war service as an aide de camp to Washington. So he has a very intimate personal relationship with the commander in chief. There's a theme there. A lot of the secretaries do. And um, then he, he is also a surgeon. So he does have that sort of medical practice. He comes from a wealthy family. And there are lots of interesting records in the 1780s and 1790s when Washington is going to and from Philadelphia and he's going to and from New York. He often will stop at McHenry's house and have dinner with him and see him. So they're clearly close. They're friends. Um, so when Pickering, when there's so many layers here, Jefferson retires, then Randolph becomes Secretary of State, then Randolph resigns in August of 1795 after many months of trying to get other people to fill that office, Pickering becomes the Secretary of State. So he's no longer the Secretary of War. McHenry becomes the Secretary of War in early 1796. He is, again, sort of a last resort. He's close to Washington. He's close to Hamilton. He's a loyal Federalist. But from the very beginning, Washington is not really pleased with his service. He often sends him letters saying, like, don't put off till tomorrow what you can do today. And after he retires, Washington and Hamilton send these letters back and forth to each other, basically saying that McHenry is terrible on his job. Not the the, the biggest ringing endorsement. Poor McHenry. Uh, poor McHenry. He was, I think the best way that you can think about it is that he did not need the money. He did not need the position. The position was not particularly glamorous. It did not come with a lot of prestige. He just wanted to be liked by Hamilton and Washington. He he valued them so much. He idolized them and he wanted them to think highly of him. And I think that's the best way to understand his service. Interesting. My, that becomes a little yeah. bit of a common theme. <laughs> because, well, last time we spoke, uh, Henry Knox, we said that they were more, he was more chummy with Washington, which not a lot of yeah. people could get away with. But, sure. but like you said, when, when Knox was trying to leave, Washington was like, but I thought we were friends here. Yeah. And, you know, same thing with, ki I guess, kind of with Randolph, although not really. But, uh, yeah, it seems to happen a few times where it's like, come on, man, I thought we were friends. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, I think they have, they had a little bit less of a friendship and more of a, he, because he wasn't in the officer corps in the same way that, that not was during the war he idolized washington he i think he really saw him as sort of a pseudo father father figure and we see that actually after washington retires and mchenry has the very unfortunate task of being the go-between between adams and washington when 
the new um, provisional army is created during the quasi war with France in 1798. And Adams is trying to get Washington to come back as commander in chief and McHenry is in charge of dealing with the negotiations. And he has to take these letters back and forth, which is a job I do not envy that would be terrible. Um, and you can just kind of tell that he's like, oh, please don't get mad at me. Please don't be mad at me. And you can just kind of tell in his language. Um, so I really don't think that he was an evil mastermind. I don't think he had any ill will towards anyone. I think he just was sort of easily duped into undermining Adams in a way he didn't necessarily even appreciate. Or like just didn't care enough to push back. Not that not, I guess I shouldn't say didn't care enough, but yeah, I mean, I think that waves. when push came to shove, his loyalties absolutely laid with Washington and Hamilton. There's no, there's no question about that. So I think that if he had been really forced to consider it, he would have sided with them. But I don't think he saw his actions as siding with them. I think that he was genuinely trying to serve multiple masters and just didn't really realize that that wasn't working. So he's the one who brought the news to a Adams that Washington says he wants Hamilton to be number two and run the show. Mm -hmm. Great. <laughs> you can imagine how well that went. Um, Adams was not pleased and McHenry had to deal with that. And McHenry was actually the one who once uh, Washington died and Adams had been selected as the Federalist candidate for the election in 1800, McHenry was the one who bore the brunt of Adams' frustrations when he finally unleashed all of his criticisms in May of 1800 and accused McHenry of, you know, conniving with Hamilton and Pickering and doing all these things. I don't, I'm, I'm very certain that Adams did not see McHenry as the mastermind and yet McHenry was the one that bore the brunt. And so I just kind of think that he was the one that everyone kind of liked to kick. Well, you know what? I think coming into this conversation, a lot of my uh estimations of mchenry are informed by that john adams little eruption at the end there um because I, am i does he fire pickering and mchenry at the same time or demand their resignations is it the same is it the same day it's um it's basically the same week so he has this outburst with mchenry he asks for mchenry's re resignation mchenry offers it immediately um he <laughs> then goes and he offers Pickering the same opportunity because resigning was the gentleman's way out. It did not harm your reputation. People resigned. It wasn't a big deal. Jefferson had done it. It was, it was fine. So he offers Pickering that same opportunity and Pickering writes the most snarky, unbelievable response back, basically saying, mm, nope, I'm going to stay in office. I need the funds and that's just what it's going to be. And so Adams writes a reply back, basically saying, no, you're fired. Um, so, but that's all in the same week. And we know about these conversations because McHenry basically writes Adams a letter saying, here's my recollection of our conversation and then sends a copy to Hamilton and Pickering as well. So they know what's going on. So, and what was it that really finally set off Ham, uh, Adams? Because Pickering and McHenry for all intents and purposes had spent his whole presidency conniving behind his back and orchestrating you know like they had a pretty large role if i'm correct in the alien and sedition acts and things of that nature which are yeah historically not great no it's definitely the low point of adam's administration and the low point of the federalist sort of uh time and power um, it's hard to say what exactly it was that set Adams off. There is no doubt that he had been festering for years at this point. Um, he his had whole been, life was festering. I'm under the <laughs> it's true. I love him, but it's true. Um, so he had been pissed basically for two years and in 17, in October of 1799, he realized, I think, the depths of betrayal when he had been gone from uh, the seat of government for so long, and Pickering and McHenry and Wolcott had sort of delayed his diplomatic envoy to France. And then he came back, he demanded that they send off this envoy, and then Hamilton comes to lecture him on foreign policy. And the, just the irony of Hamilton, who had never held a single diplomatic position, lecturing Adams, who had held every diplomatic position, is just too much. 
Adams could take it. So that happens in October of 1799. But he waits, and I think that he waits for two reasons. One, Washington dies in December of 1799. And I think that he was so wary of that comparison. And when Washington dies, he almost goes through this process. Um, the painting in the rotunda actually of the Capitol is called the apotheosis of George Washington. And it's like he becomes this demigod and he becomes no longer a mortal human. And so Adams is almost freed of all comparisons between he and Washington because Washington is no longer a mortal. So he's almost really freed by that experience. Second, in spring of, of 1800, the Federalist Party selects Adams again as his president, as the presidential election candidate. And I think he was honestly waiting for that to happen. And I think he probably was planning to do some sort of reorganization, but in true Adams fashion, he sort of has this regular meeting with McHenry. They're talking about a vacancy. McHenry stands up to leave and Adams loses it. And so it, I honestly don't think it was intended. I don't think there was any one thing that finally released him. I think he just couldn't help himself anymore. Yeah, and it was poor McHenry just happened to be the target yep he just happened to be the one in the room at the time amazing um we should probably transition we have two more people to run through um today <laughs> um uh all why don't we move on to oliver wolcott jr uh the son of a signer of the declaration of independence and the articles of confederation uh quick sum up his dad was doing really important work for Connecticut during the revolutionary, <laughs> like one of yeah. Connecticut's major yeah. founders. Uh, yeah. Wolcott, uh, I'm, yeah, Wolcott Jr. I believe he, I'm assuming he studies at Yale. That might not be true. That's just because he's from Connecticut. I made that assumption. <laughs> um, <laughs> but he, he, in the early 1780s, starts working his way up in Connecticut uh, politics, especially in accounting. He does a mm -hmm. lot with Connecticut's like uh, uh, the state's accounts. And uh, the government gets created, 1789. Uh, I believe Wolcott is brought in like immediately by Hamilton. Is he the, he's the first, is it comptroller? Mm -hmm. Yes. So he's the first comptroller, which is one of those fancy financial terms that I try and pretend I know. <laughs> so I don't know that anyone really knows what that means, to be honest, other than maybe economists. Um, I think the important thing to know is that he was basically Hamilton's number two. And so he was essential in how Hamilton organized the Treasury Department, and he also depended on Hamilton for his career. And so that is basically all you need to know about his loyalties and where things lay. He was, of course, loyal to Washington, too. Um, he, I think, was a little bit less extreme in some of his positions and the way that he articulated them than Pickering. So what's fascinating is once Adams offers Pickering the opportunity to resign, he leaves Wolcott in office until the following year. And um, Wolcott then resigns in, in, later, um, but he doesn't fire him. And I think that there's a couple of reasons. I think Adams wasn't out to complete a wholesale reorganization of the executive branch, but he also had a sense that maybe Wolcott was somebody he could work with a little bit more. So there was no doubt that he was very financially competent. Um, he was good at his jobs. So there wasn't the same sort of ability questions that applied to McHenry and maybe even Pickering. Um, he, he was a perfectly fine secretary of the treasury and did a perfectly good job at that. Um, he was 100% loyal to Hamilton and Washington, but he wasn't the same sort of evil villain that we see with some of the other people. Well, I assume, so we had spoke about Albert Gallatin earlier, which he would go on to be Jefferson's Secretary mm -hmm. of Treasury and Madison's for a bit. Um, and when I, in the biography of him, it really makes clear that the thing that made Gallatin so special is he was one of the few American founders who could actually understand Hamilton's financial plan. Because, yeah. you know, it's hard for us to talk about it because I don't know about you, but I'm not a financial genius. Uh, yeah. But Gallatin was, and he under, at least understood what was going on, which many other founders didn't. And Wolcott, as you say, being his number two, I have to assume was some kind of financial genius just to keep up with Hamilton. So that seems to make him a natural choice to stick around. And I mean, who would Adams have chosen 
to take over this nascent, you know, fledgling financial plan that we still live under 200 years yeah, later? Yeah, it's a really good question. I, I mean, I think that Wolcott presents sort of an interesting case study in the way that others don't because there wasn't a number two at the state department at the time there wasn't a number two at the war department they had clerks of course um a couple of them it was very small department but there wasn't a designated number two in the same way that there was the treasury department and because wolcott had so much financial training in a way that most people didn't he did understand the plans and so he did serve as a competent secretary of the treasury and i think that's the one position where it kind of makes sense that maybe adams would keep him i mean i understand the rationale for keeping all of them but that would have been harder to replicate whereas there are plenty of people who had to work experience and plenty of people who had diplomatic experience that maybe adams could have selected for the other positions right and it probably doesn't hurt i mean i'll have to glance at the list of names and think about it but uh Wolcott's the only one who John Adams was with his father when they both signed the Declaration of Independence together. Uh, so he probably, in a fashion, I mean, Massachusetts, Connecticut, but they probably, in a fashion, had that kind of, if not a relationship, I mean, it's his friend's kid, but like that understanding, that that bond that we were talking about how Washington is so close with all of these other people and Adams is close with zero people, except maybe his wife probably his sons. <laughs> but, uh, it seems yeah, like... no, I do think that those cultural bonds meant a lot. And I think that the cultural differences between New England and places like Virginia or South Carolina, they exist today, but they very much existed then. And um, I think perhaps even more so. The sort of Puritan blood in New England ran deep and there were religious differences and cultural differences. And, um, you know, I mean, Adams did have a couple of friends. He was close with Benjamin Rush, but there were, they were sort of fewer and farther between. And so I do think those New England ties probably went a long way. Yeah. Well, and he's losing Thomas Jefferson at this point as a longtime friend. <laughs> Although I will say, as far as New England ties goes, well, Pickering was from Massachusetts, as was Adams, but I guess Pickering's just, you know, one You're of those such, people. <laughs> he was such a jerk. <laughs> I know I shouldn't say that, because that's yeah. not very, like, historically rigorous, but yeah. No, but after a lot of historical study, it's uh, the conclusion we've arrived <laughs> <laughs> I will say the one thing to his credit, I think that he really loved his family. He was very devoted to his wife and his children and their health wasn't always the greatest. And so that's like the one redeeming quality yeah. that we can find with him. Well, and I will say, I did want to note before we talked about him, about his service in the revolution. Like he wrote the first military okay. training manual for the Continental yep. Army. Yep. You know, he, totally. he did serve valiantly. I think it was a Jutan general, I think was his title one of those that sounds right running the army generalships as yeah. opposed to the like at in battle fighting so yeah. as we close off here we should probably mention charles lee who is not to be confused with the general charles lee whose character also might be questionable uh this charles <laughs> lee of virginia is a member of the lee family uh the only one to serve in the early administrations um He's a cousin of most of the famous Lees. He's a brother of Henry Light Horse Harry Lee, and therefore actually an uncle of uh, Robert E. Lee, but that's a different war. <laughs> and, uh, and he is a young attorney who makes his way up, kind of fails his way up. He, he participates in a lot of early Supreme Court cases. Okay, you're laughing at that, so you understand what I'm going for. Uh, I believe the article I wrote about him was like, Charles Lee loses his way to Attorney General, because like, he participates in a lot of really important cases. He just seems to usually be on the losing end of those cases. Well, there's that joke, you know, that, um, what is it, mediocre white men fail up, and Charles Lee, I think, is the perfect example of that. Um, also, I mean, Virginia society at the time was just so darn incestuous, so <laughs> looking at those family trees, it's, uh, I actually received, I was doing a presentation today, and I received this question, is, is it the same Charles Lee as the other Charles Lee? It's like, no, they just didn't have very creative names. Right. We'll so, like, um, yeah. 
Charles Lee uh, wasn't in office very long for Washington and had a pretty unremarkable tenure other than he supported Washington's use of executive privilege for the first time in 1796. They all did. It was a unanimous decision. Interesting. He does have a little bit... Um, He's not all that, frankly, all that remarkable in Adam's tenure either, except that I will say that he did not always agree in lockstep with Pickering and Walcott. There are times that he disagreed about things. And so he was definitely a federalist. No, there's no doubt about it. And he provided an important geographic diversity because he was from Virginia. But he was not the same sort of committed federalist that Hamilton and Pickering and Walcott were in the same way. And he was not as tied to their futures because he did not have the same sort of personal relationships that the others had. Yeah. Well, he was also a Lee and many of them were uh, anti-federalists during the ratification convention. Um, yeah, some were. The family were was one definitely of the most divided. powerful families in one of the most powerful states. And why would they want to give that up exactly? <laughs> <laughs> yes, no, they were definitely divided as a family. So. Um, Henry Lighthorse Lee actually was the person who um, co-led the mil militia forces with Hamilton during the Whiskey Rebellion. He marched out west um, with those forces in 1784. So he was definitely a Federalist and somebody that Washington tried to get to come into office and he said no. Um, so there were a series of those. Um, and, you know, the Lee family is just... Well, Such a we had story. Uh, biographer uh, Lee, Bi Henry biographer Henry Lee, uh, biographer Ryan Coles came on a few weeks ago to talk about his whole life. It ended up being a very thorough conversation, and it's when you spoke last time about Rutledge and how his reputation was tarnished. It reminded Randolph. me very much of how Henry Lighthorse Harry Lee's life also was tarnished. Mm. Working with George Washington, <laughs> that kind of happens, doesn't it? <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, and he just, you know, uh, his financial instability later in life, there, there are a lot of people that that happened to Robert Morris is another example where they came upon really hard financial times from speculation and other poor choices. And, um, you know, people who had really extraordinary stories sort of end up kind of being forgotten a little bit. Yeah, the land, yeah, the land speculation is... <laughs> I always it's not kind great. of feel like that's your fault. Do you know what I mean? Like you invested all your money it's in true. land. I know it's he invested all his great. money in the revolution first. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes, it's true. Robert Morris can be forgiven because he invested so much in the army. Agreed. Lee, not so much. Although there, he is still remembered um, in Alexandria in Old Town, Virginia, because his home and Robert E. Lee's boyhood home uh, still stands in Virginia. So it is, there are a lot of historic sites there that you can visit. I know. There's so many good historic sites. I, I want to get to all of them. Uh, it's, it's, so, there's such a big list. It's hard to choose. I know. Tell me about it. Right now I'm focused on the Northeast. I'll make my way South as Excellent. I cover everything around here. <laughs> um, is there anything else we should add about Charles Lee that I will say uh, the name is escaping me. Uh, Thomas Jefferson's attorney general. So uh, he had a couple. Um, that was the one position that he actually had some turnover. Right. His first, um, gosh, this is now going to test me. I think Levi Lincoln was his first. I, okay, yes. Um, it, and I, then he died in office and Caesar Rodney was the second. Yes. Okay, Caesar Rodney Jr., because we're not creative with names. Another declaration right. signer. <laughs> yes. That's, that's Rodney, William Bradford, <laughs> um, yeah, Oliver Wolcott. <laughs> they all have their father's name. Anyway, uh, it was Levi Lincoln because he was there for Marbury versus Madison. And uh, he was questioned. Charles Lee ends up being one of the prosecutors in Marbury versus Madison. So a former attorney general questioned the sitting attorney general <laughs> in one of the most famous Supreme Court cases in American history. So that's uh... a fun fact for you. <laughs> it's so funny, you know, I mean, like some of these things, it's, we think that DC is a small world today, but if you think of the, so for example, the first impeachment proceeding justice, which was Samuel Chase, the, so the person presiding over that was the vice president was Aaron Burr. Who had just killed Alexander Hamilton. Correct. Um, 
the entire cabinet and uh, Jefferson were in attendance. So that's Madison, Gallatin, you know, Jefferson, they're all there. In the Senate is John Quincy Adams, and he's sitting there as one of the jurors sending back descriptions to his father at home about what's happening. And John Randolph of Virginia is the one presiding the case, and he has terrible health issues, and his prescription is to drink wine laced with opium. So he is literally falling down drunk and high on opium and wine, trying to preside over this case. It is ridiculous. And so I highly recommend reading about that case study, but it shows just how tiny Washington, D.C. actually was. Wasn't Charles Lee also... Was he, uh, no, he, did, I want to say he was one of the defense attorneys in that, but I might be confusing <laughs> it with the Burr trial. Charles, uh, I think might that's have the Burr trial. Burr, yeah. The, one of the main, oh gosh, now I'm forgetting his name. One of the main attorneys was, I think a different senator. There were handful. Anyway, it's, yeah. it's a ridic it is a ridiculous case. It is. It's the type of stuff that if you came up with it in a movie, they would say, no, that could never happen. Right. And that's totally what happened. Yeah, it was the first, uh, he was was impeached in the House and then it went to trial in the Senate. And again, another yep. signer of the Declaration of Independence. <laughs> now They really needed to later. be more creative with these people because it was just all the same people again and again. It's really crazy. There's a little, <laughs> it's not a lot of difference, but there's a little difference between like the Declaration and the Constitution. That 10, 11 years. Yep. There's some same names, but there's some different names. But those are the same names. I mean, Elbridge Gerry si signs the Declaration and then like he's still... <laughs> in office when John Quincy Adams comes in as Secretary of State. You know, like, it's it's always fun. Uh, uh, it's Dr. never boring. No, I, I'm I'm having a great time right now. So I hate to call it, but Dr. Travinsky, we're closing <laughs> on an hour. So thank you so much for coming. Please feel free to come back and chit chat about the Rev War anytime. My pleasure. Well, once I have the Adams book along a little bit farther, we can bash Pickering a little bit more. Oh, the what fun. <laughs> <laughs> well thank you so much for having me i appreciate it absolutely uh founder fans again that's dr lindsay chervinsky she wrote the book the cabinet which we've kind of been discussing but you need to buy it and read it or listen to it or whatever way you want to consume it i'm putting a link in the description below thank you so much for being here i will be back with another founder for you tomorrow